Hi, I'm Becky Hunt, and I am on a life mission to help other women going through trials reclaim their joy. I'm a mother of three, and I understand pain and loss firsthand. I survived melanoma cancer, type 1 diabetes, Graves' disease, and several eating disorders, but the most difficult thing that I've survived is the loss of one of my daughters at only 82 days old. No one should have to carry the unbearable weight of child loss alone, which is how I came to be on this journey to unite women through their pain, forming a community of feminine strength that together can face all obstacles. Hey friends, <laughs> this is part two of my story. Uh, if you haven't listened to part one, go ahead and do that first uh, because this is just a continuation of the last episode, which I talk about my story of my firstborn and how she was born with a congenital heart defect and all of the days that we lived at the hospital and that whole story. So please go and listen to that because that is probably the most important part of my story. And it's the part that, yeah, it's heart-wrenching, but at the same time, like, we all go through these times in our lives of grief and loss, and they are absolutely soul-crushing and life-crushing. And when you're deep in them, it's hard to even think that there might be a way out and that you might find joy again. But my story, my journey is proof that it does come back. You can reclaim it. You can fight through it. And I promise you, you can feel happiness again. So I left off in the last episode uh, talking about where we placed the ashes of my daughter in Lake Superior in Grand Marais, Minnesota. And after we came back from that trip, I was kind of lost. I didn't know what to do next. I had left my job a few weeks before Gracie had passed away uh, because I needed to be in the hospital with her. I needed to be with her. I needed to be at home when she eventually went home. <laughs> to be with her 24 seven. And she needed me more than I needed that job. And so I didn't have a job. I didn't have a baby to take care of. And I'm, you know, how many months postpartum, four months postpartum, and I have nothing to show for it. I have, there's just such an emptiness, such a feeling of what's the purpose of my life? You know, and I know that is a depressing thing to, to to think about and say out loud, but that was my reality for a really long time. Like I didn't see the point. I couldn't see past grief and living life without her. I didn't want to. I am a doer. <laughs> so instead of laying in bed all day, I had the desire to be in my kitchen all day. And so I was baking and I shared in the last episode that I went to culinary school and I learned more in my own kitchen than I did at culinary school. (laughs) Uh, So I just, I started coming up with recipes. I started baking all the time and it was just this escape from my sadness for a while. It was just this place where I felt okay and somewhat human (laughs) and so I kept on baking I kept on baking I kept on coming up with more and more recipes and not enough mouths to feed and my husband just couldn't eat it all (laughs) if you know him he's this tall slim guy that can eat whatever he wants and not gain a pound right he was like, Becky, I can I cannot eat all of this. You need to figure out where else you can put it. <laughs> and I woke up one day and I was getting ready in my massive closet that I had in that house. 
I just had this vision in my mind and I believe that God placed it there. He showed me this vision of me being in the kitchen, baking these amazing cakes and decorating them in all shapes and sizes and colors and techniques and just delivering them to kids with congenital heart defects, just like my Gracie was born with. And I felt happy seeing that vision. And I was like, okay, God, <laughs> uh, is, this, is this what I'm supposed to be doing with all of these cakes that I'm making? And uh, he told me, yes. He said, yeah, go and do it, Becky. Go and serve. And I was so thankful that God gave me something to do. <laughs> so I filed for a nonprofit 501c3 organization and I got it. And I just started making these great big dream cakes for kids with congenital heart defects. It was like I was taking care of Gracie again in a way. And I had always imagined making thousands of cakes for her throughout her life, for every occasion, for every celebration, every milestone. And in a way, this felt like I was still making those cakes by donating them to kids just like her. Kids that need an escape from, you know, the hospital stuff and the medical stuff and just have a little bit of normalcy in front of them and a way to celebrate them as a normal kid because that is exactly what they are. They just have a special heart. That's it. And I remember so many times in the hospital where I was asked, so will she ever be able to run Will she ever be able to play sports? Will she ever be able to blah, blah, blah? It bothered me so much because, yes, my, my daughter has a broken heart. And she's going to have surgeries for the rest of her life. She's going to have complications. She's still going to be able to run. She's still going to be able to dance, sing, play an instrument, jump up and down and run around. Like... She's still going to be able to do that in her own way. And these kids that I have come to love and support and just like absolutely fall in love with them. I see them doing amazing things all the time. And it amazes me. And it just, it makes me think about Gracie and that, and that is so comforting. So here I am making all these cakes and delivering them to hospitals and all over like Wisconsin, Minnesota, even North Dakota and bringing joy to these kids and their parents. And like, I remember bringing a cake to the hospital one day and it was for this kiddo that had been in the hospital for quite a few months and I, I brought it into his hospital room and he saw his cake <laughs> and his face just lit up and he had smiles and he was so thankful and he just loved his cake so much and he couldn't wait to taste it. And I remember seeing his mom and dad just in tears because they hadn't seen their son smile and laugh and be joyful in weeks. And through a little thing like a cake, I was able to bring that. I was able to bring joy to their son and happiness to them to see him joyful. And that right there is the reason. <laughs> Making parents cry is the reason <laughs> that I still do it to this day. Um, even, what, nine, ten years later? And not to say that this was the reason Gracie was in our lives, was to start this nonprofit. No, absolutely not. There was no reason. There was absolutely no reason that my child died. And don't go looking for one, ever. 
but it is a blessing that came from such a dark, dark place. And it was my saving grace to giving me a purpose behind the pain. Now, of course, you know, running a nonprofit, you don't make profit. <laughs> you receive your donations, but you put those donations into buying the ingredients and the supplies and the gas to deliver the cakes. And you, you don't yourself see a penny of that. <laughs> um, so to be perfectly frank with you, uh, we weren't doing so good financially. And so I got a few part-time jobs uh, working outside the home. Uh, we got pregnant with our second baby girl, and she was born healthy in January 2014. And I did a few, like, direct sales <laughs> things throughout the years just to make ends meet. And I was still doing the nonprofit. I was I was just busy, 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 and I've found that through the years, this is just what I do. I throw myself into businesses and being busy to distract myself from my grief and my feelings and emotions, and that wasn't necessarily a healthy thing to do, but it's just how I coped. Now, I'm going to talk more details about, you know, what has happened between then and where I'm at now um, as far as, like, businesses and <laughs> different things I started and ended and throwing myself into things. Uh, I'm going to go over more of that in my memoir uh, because I don't want to keep you all day because that is literally how long it would take to explain all of it. <laughs> but now the next part of my story is one that definitely caught everybody by surprise. It's my story of cancer. Halfway through my pregnancy with Gracie in 2012, I noticed this itchy bump on my back one day and I was like what in the world is that it feels disgusting <laughs> right and looking as well as I could in the mirror uh because it was literally right behind my bra on the middle of my back and a place that never sees a light of day uh so I noticed this mole when I was pregnant it was itchy, it bothered me, it was raised, it it was kind of dark and not symmetrical. And so I, you know, told my doctors about it and every single one of them said, oh, you know what, moles just change during pregnancy, don't worry about it. It's probably nothing. And so I was like, okay, fine, <laughs> I'll move on. And the mole kept on, you know, bothering me. It was itchy, but I was like, nope, it's, it's fine. Doctors told me it was fine. And then I had Gracie, and then I had my daughter Amelia. And, and then in 2015, I went to a dermatologist for the first time because I was having some really bad eczema that winter. And the eczema would come and go and come and go. And I just could not keep rid of it. And so I was like, oh, I'm going to go to the dermatologist. And so I went for the first time in my life. I went and sure enough, it was eczema. He gave me this cream and it was fine. But since I was at the derm, he wanted to look over my skin. So, you know, put on a paper gown and he looked over all of my moles and can I just say that I'm so thankful that he did. I pointed out the mole that had you know still been bothering me for the past three years and I said hey you know what this one has kind of bothered me for like a really long time can you check that one out and sure enough he wanted to take a biopsy of it and a few weeks later, I got a phone call 
from the dermatologist himself, which is never, ever a good sign. But he basically told me the three words that you never wish to hear in your life. You have cancer. And I thought I was going to die. I started thinking about what my daughter's lives would be like growing up without me. I started talking to my husband about, hey, what if I'm not here in a year? What if, what if I'm gone? How are you going to survive without me? I was terrified. I was terrified. And I got the mole uh, surgically removed. I got a huge, huge, like almost palm print, print size <laughs> of skin taken from my back uh, and stitched up. And there were two lymph nodes that were positive that they found, which basically means that the cancer had spread into my lymph nodes and were on the way to work into my organs. So I had another surgery two weeks later in my armpit and they removed all of the lymph nodes just to be sure that the cancer was actually gone. Then I was staged for stage 3A melanoma cancer, which is very scary, life-threatening. Not a lot of people live longer than five years with this. Okay, so I was looking at life in a whole new way and was doing everything that I could to find a doctor that could do something. And I got two different opinions. I sought out the second one myself at Mayo Clinic. One doctor in the cities told me, hey, there's only one option for you. For treatment and you're basically going to feel like you have the puke flu every single day for the next year and you're gonna have to come in every day for an injection that did not sound good to me <laughs> so I was like there's gotta be there has to be another option there has to be and so I went to Mayo Clinic myself I said hey can I just have a consultation with one of your oncologists? And I met with one, and they told me, wow, yeah, we never give that treatment to any of our patients. <laughs> and that alarmed me, but also like put this huge chunk of confidence and reassurance in myself that, wow, I did the right thing in getting a second opinion. And so this oncologist uh, recommended a few different things. One of those was a clinical trial uh, that was immunotherapy at Mayo, and I opted to do that. And it was going to take two years to get through all of the injections and treatment. and another three years beyond that with just doing testing every few months. And so I did it. I, I signed up for the trial because I wanted a chance at life. I wanted to still be able to take care of my two-year-old at the time. And I needed to be here for her and my husband and my family. And I wanted to fight. So I started the trial and it made me feel awful. I was tired all the time. I lost my appetite. I felt weak. I felt sick. I felt like my mind was leaving me. And during this time, I also decided to go vegan uh, because I had done so much research and I knew that this is what I had to do to keep the cancer out of my body and to keep me healthy during these treatments. And so vegan was that thing, that extra little thing that was going to help me. And every single oncologist that I talked to about diet and this cancer said the exact same thing. They said, hey, 
you know, the best thing you can do when it comes to diet is very extreme. It's very hard. <laughs> I just remember hearing every uncle just say, it's very extreme. I don't know if you're going to be willing to try it. <laughs> but every single one of them said going vegan was going to help the most. And so I had got to tell every single one of them, oh great, I already did. <laughs> I think that between this treatment, between my diet and still staying active. I mean, I even ran a half marathon in the middle of treatment, like a year into it. I trained for a half marathon and I ran a half marathon. When I started this cancer treatment, I was also told by multiple oncologists that I shouldn't have any more babies. So no more pregnancies, no more children of our own. Um, and that was absolutely devastating because I married my husband dreaming of like having four kids and we had already lost one and we only had one in our arms. So I prayed, I prayed for five years for contentment with just having Amelia in our home and in our arms. And I did not feel content at all. The, the desire to have another baby just grew. Like God was, had another plan for me and I was fighting it. So at the end of my five-year trial, I asked my oncologist one more time, can we talk about pregnancy again? Because I, we so wish to have another baby of our own. And the oncologists say, okay, yeah. I mean, you're the healthiest patient we have. I don't see why not. And this was the same oncologist <laughs> that I had been with for the five years. Um, one that in the beginning told me no more babies and she had full confidence that I would be okay and that baby would be okay and I was absolutely shocked because I was totally be prepared to like being shut down and like starting to think about adoption and adoption was just never on my heart and I kept on having dreams about having two kids in our home and we went on to to uh making that happen <laughs> to spare you all the details um I found out that I was pregnant um in September of 2019 uh was actually the very first day that my daughter Amelia went off to kindergarten on the bus for the first time it's the same day that I found out that I was pregnant and I actually filmed uh, taking that pregnancy test, <laughs> my reaction. Uh, every single time that I had taken a pregnancy test, like in those summer months, I sat down with the camera in front of me because I wanted to make a really cool video to remember it by. So. I kept on deleting every time that I had a negative pregnancy test and that one time that I had a positive one, I was so glad that I pressed record. And then 2020 happened <laughs> and my daughter was sent home when I was very, very pregnant um, for the rest of the year, not to go back to school. <laughs> So my kitchen table turned into a very big, large, full school desk. And I spent our full days just with Amelia at the kitchen table doing school. And I was miserable. <laughs> it was awful. I, di I didn't get to have a baby shower. I didn't get to go out and shop for the things that I needed to be prepared for the baby to come, like diapers and wipes and <laughs> like the essentials. And let me tell you, toilet paper was not the only thing that was hard to find in 2020 at the beginning of the pandemic. Diapers and formula 
were two things that were very, very hard to find and very hard to come by at that time too, when I was about to have a baby. I wanna know who was hoarding all of the diapers and the formula because how rude, okay? Having a baby in the early stages of a pandemic in 2020 was very scary. I was afraid that my husband wasn't be going to be able to be there during the birth or be there during my hospital stay, helping me take care of my baby after a C-section. But he was. My best friend and doula couldn't be there. My family and my, my own daughter couldn't come and see baby after she was born. And her birth was a little traumatic um, just because she came out purple. Uh, I was terrified that I was going to lose her too. So I didn't really get to have any time with with my third baby. Um, it was it was yeah, it was, it was traumatizing having that experience all over again of no, you can't hold your baby that you just had. <laughs> uh, we have to keep her alive. So we hadn't had a name for her picked out before she came. We wanted to decide when we saw her. And I just remember the nurses kept on coming into my recovery room asking, hey, do you have a name yet that we can put on the birth certificate? Hey, do you have a name yet? Do you have a name yet? Do you have a name yet? <laughs> and I'm like, no, no, I need to see and have time with my baby to decide what her name is. But she was just going through test after test after test, which I'm so grateful for that they did all these tests to make sure that she was okay. She was just having really low blood sugars. And me being type 1 diabetic and just having a baby, those babies have a tendency to have low blood sugars. So we had a hard time getting her blood sugars to stay up. And um, when I finally did get her in my arms for longer than two minutes, <laughs> I finally saw her face and she looked exactly like Gracie. I, when I say exactly, like I felt like Gracie was brought back to me and it was so comforting and it was so beautiful. And you might hear that and think, oh, wow, she's just going to think this new baby who is a different baby from Gracie, going to think that this baby is Gracie and think that she got her baby back. No, I didn't. And this third child, very, very different personality from Gracie. She just looked just like her. And because of that, I just remembered the time where I sang Amazing Grace to Gracie in her hospital room. And so we named our third baby girl, Maisie, M-A-I-Z-I-E, Grace. And yes, after the song Amazing Grace that I sang to our first baby girl. We got to bring her home. We got to introduce her to Amelia and my parents, and then everybody else met her through a glass window or door <laughs> because 2020 sucked, <laughs> and we were so terrified of losing this third baby that I we just did everything that we could to keep her safe, and I, sure, I feel a little bit guilty about saying, hey, sorry, you can't come over and meet her. I'm sorry. I am a horrible person. Um, no, I wasn't a horrible person because I was doing everything in my power that I could to keep my baby safe, to keep us all safe. And we didn't know much about COVID at that time. It was just scary and too many unknowns and I don't I wouldn't say it was a lonely time like I missed my family and I missed talking to other human beings <laughs> but at the same time it was kind of a blessing because with Gracie 
I didn't get to have any of that newborn beautiful time together and with Amelia I was just always busy I was always working I was always making cakes I was always trying to make a book and I feel like I missed out on that newborn stage with her too so with Maisie I just embraced that time I just soaked her up every chance I could and I slowed down and I'm so glad that I did And then, of course, my uh, body image past came back to me. And, uh, of course, you know, after having a baby, after having three babies, like, you, your body changes a lot. (laughs) And clothes don't fit anymore. And you just feel flubby and squishy and just (laughs) not attractive at all. And as soon as my doctor gave me the okay to get back into exercise, I did. I just went for it. And then I got into, you know, restrictive eating again. And I just, I wanted to fit back into my clothes because I had no clothes except for my sweatpants that fit me. And I did not feel pretty. I did not feel like I was enough. And... It became a really depressing time for me and I started getting so tired. My anxiety was through the roof. I started having panic attacks. I started thinking and feeling that I was dying (laughs) and I didn't know what to do. I didn't know what I was doing wrong. I tried to pick apart everything in my life that would make me feel this way but I was doing everything right. And I started having heart palpitations, tremors in my hands, along with carpal tunnel because I'm a cake decorator. I felt like my body was falling apart and I didn't know what to do. And so I let this go on for months because I thought, okay, well, what if I just start eating better? What if I just start start eating more? What if I take a few rest days? You know, what if I take more naps? (laughs) My life for a while just started becoming like trying to figure out how to take care of myself (laughs) and baby and a seven-year-old at the time. And it was a lot and I couldn't handle it much longer. I was so sad and depressed all the time and it did it make sense? Because I had no reason to be depressed. I finally went to my doctor and I said, here's all the things that are going on. Something is wrong. And so he took some blood tests and sure enough, my thyroid came back and it was overactive. And then we went on to do further tests. We tested for Hashimoto's, we tested for Graves' disease, and I got a phone call that I needed to get on a serious medication for Graves' disease because I tested positive for it. Basically, Graves' disease is a thyroid disease, an autoimmune disorder, just like type 1 diabetes is, where the thyroid is overactive, your metabolism is so high, your body is fighting so hard, and it, it It's basically just (laughs) attacking itself. And that was the reason why I was so tired all the time. That's the reason I had tremors and heart palpitations. And I found out that if I didn't start taking this crazy medication with these crazy symptoms, that I could suffer from a heart attack. And I wasn't about to go give up on life. Because I had a lot of it to live and I had a lot of dreams to make happen, right? So I started taking medication, still felt awful. A few few months later, I started to finally feel normal again. I still have days where I feel my Graves' disease is (laughs) taking over and it's so frustrating and all I want to do is sleep. But I guess that's the reality for the rest of my life. Um... But it was just a slap in the face just knowing that another thing, God? Like, haven't I been through enough? Haven't haven't I 
learned enough lessons here to <laughs> live a life with meaning and purpose and what are you trying to teach me here god and the answer was to just slow down to just rest and to be honest with you i don't know the last time that i had taken a sabbath <laughs> Like a day of rest, full day rest, without working or without working out or just taking a nap, you know? Or, you know, my biggest desire at the time during this was to just sit down and watch a Hallmark movie on the couch and eat popcorn and chocolate. And for the first time in my life, when I decided that I was going to allow myself to do that, it was so... Oh, restorative for me. And I started to pray for things like joy. Like, God, uh, can I, you just sprinkle some joy on my day, please? And I started having little moments throughout my days just laughing so hard at some crazy thing that my eight year old said. Or some weird dance move that my husband was doing in the kitchen and you know like <laughs> I just I felt joyful again and I felt so good I felt so good and where I'm at right now is writing this memoir about all the obstacles and adversity that I've been through in my life overcoming them finding joy again and that's why I named this podcast Reclaiming Joy because I want to talk about all this stuff that has made Becky Becky and I want to talk about the struggles. I want to talk about real life stuff. I want to have guests on my show that have had really tough, tough circumstances thrown their way and somehow overcome them. And as I started writing this memoir, I realized that, you know, talking about my childhood and my upbringing and my eating disorders, and I realized that, holy moly, I'm still restricting myself. I'm still stuck in this mentality that I'm fat and I'm not pretty and I am not good enough. And I need to work harder. And I need to lose more weight. My eating disorder is still very, very much a thing. <laughs> and I realized that I there is no joy here. How can I write a book about reclaiming joy and still have something going on in my life that is very much in the forefront of it? That is not joyful at all. And so I decided, okay, it's time to heal. It's time to get help with this. I am so ready to kick this thing to the curb and figure this out. And so I hired an eating disorder recovery coach and I am actually going to a psychiatrist this week to talk to her. I might find a dietitian to work with. I don't know, but I'm making some big changes in my life and it's so uncomfortable. It's so uncomfortable and I'm so frustrated with the years and years that I spent just damaging my body and I feel awful for doing that to myself and like I lived 18 years plus with this in my brain and it's not going to be easy to get through and get over and I may never get over some of it but I am going to do my darn hardest to try so that's where I'm at right now writing this memoir battling through eating disorder recovery and taking care of babies <laughs> and there is so much more to my story but this is just a few of the things that have shaped Becky into who Becky is. And I want to talk more in depth about all of them. I want to talk to other people that have had similar 
circumstances and are battling some really, really, really hard fights. So I hope that you'll join me (laughs) and subscribing to this podcast. Um, Write a little review and leave me a comment. Let me know what other podcast subjects, topics, everything that you want to hear on my podcast. Thank you for listening and I hope you have a fantastic day.